Welcome to Otautau Connect. This is the message of the week. We pray you'll be blessed by this message. All right, so um, really excited. We are in part three um, of a series. The series is actually about laying our ego on the altar, but the overarching theme of our series is to walk in love. And I have, um, I just, I always feel guided, um, of course, by God and the Holy Spirit for what we're gonna speak about. But I do wanna say that I feel at times that it's so prophetic. And I wanna say to me, I feel that this series is prophetic. I'm just prophesying over it that I believe that what is happening next door, and you see all these things coming out of the ground, you know, the foundation, what is happening there in the natural, God is doing something here in our lives. And as he is building that up in the natural, he's building stuff up here in our lives. And so pay attention, you know, just, just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this series? How am I learning? What am I to do? How am I gonna walk in love. And um, of course, the, the greatest commandment is when um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and of course, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is why I thought it was so important this morning, because sometimes we, we, we don't love ourselves. We see it, we, we, we see yourself, ourselves as inadequate and not good enough. And that is not, that is a lie, all right? That is not how God sees us. And we need to learn um, to see ourselves how God sees us. And we need to learn to see others as God sees us. And so he's saying the second is like this, love your neighbor as you love yourselves. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So basically, if you go to the library and you get the summary of a book, did you used to do that when you were in high school? That's what I would use to do. We had to read all these books. I didn't read the book. I read the summary. If that's you, that is the summary. It's a good summary. But then Jesus goes and says this. So just before, you know, he's having a supper with his disciples, his friends. He's been with them for the last three years. And he's now put, lifting the standard. And he's saying, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. That is now the standard. So it's not just love God, love the others like you love yourself. <laughs> no, love God and love others like I love you. So we're saying to each other, we're saying that our prayer should be this, reduce me to love. What I mean with reduce, there's so much other stuff. That's not, you know, that it's not about that. It is about love. So reduce me to love and let my whole body be wholly filled and flooded with love. In our destination, I got this quote from Joyce Meyer and I, and I so love it. This is our destination. You know, our destination is not to be a Bible scholar. Our destination is not a tick list of how, how often you go to church. Our destination is Christ-likeness, to respond to people and things and situations the way Jesus did when he was here. I'm saying that to you. I'm saying to the people who are watching online right now, that is our destination, to respond just the way Jesus would and have. And I always go back to this picture because just to, just to reiterate again, we are being transformed not so that God will love us more, not so that God will think, well, thank goodness they're over there. Now I like them better. Um, but it, and, and I like that you love about, laugh about it, Jenny. We do. But it is also true, isn't it? In our mind, we have this thing because we, th we see God as a father and there's children and we think, but there's probably children he likes better because you know, they're, they're not, not getting in trouble as much. And so you try to be the good kid. Well, that's me, I'm from a family of six. You try to be the good one. You, you want your, your dad's um, loving eye over him. But no, 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 God loves us equal and he loves us 
Like, he can't love us more or less. He is love. And so in creation, that was all fine. We were in harmony. Everything was good and perfect. Then the fall came. So you've got to just blame the fall. <laughs> all right. But thank God for Jesus. And now we are just working our way from glory to glory. So be glad where you are right now. Thank God you're not who you used to be. <laughs> but we still got a way to go to walk in love. So let's really together ponder on how we can walk in love. And so there's a couple of things here, and we're just we're, we're diving in, but this is a long intro, but it's just because I believe this is for a whole season. This is not just once we're done about the ego, there's other things. This is like for a season. Know who you are in Christ. It has to start with that. Study God's word. That means study. All right, just reading the word, the word of today, that's really good. That, that's really good, but that's not study. Study as well. Spend time with God, follow leadership of the Holy Spirit. But for the last couple of weeks, we've been working on our ego. The ego has to go. And so we need to put the ego on the altar. So this is not alter ego, it's not a spelling mistake. It is we are putting the ego, that which is not in line with God, perspective of how we see things, that needs to go on the altar. So, last week we talked about our need for control. And we learned together, and if you haven't seen it, just go and watch it again, or if you need to watch it again. Um, when, when, first of all, you've got to name that thing that you control or want to control, trying to control, and then ask yourself these three questions. Is it worth my concern? Because so often <laughs> it's really not worth, worth it, is it? It's really not worth it. And secondly, is it mine to control? And sometimes that is yes, but oftentimes that is no. And then ask, is it for God alone? And then um, bring it to God. I'm not going to preach that message again, just listen to it. But I can say, and I wondered if somebody else has had the same experience, but for the last seven days, this has freed me. For the last seven days, there were things I was just about to, I was just about to open my mouth. And I went like, is it worth it? Is it my ticket to And I zipped it. Thank you. And Abe said, <laughs> amen. <laughs> and it's freeing. I can't tell you how freeing it is. Some of the things, you know, you give it to God. You, 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 and there are still situations, but you just love the, the people, the situation, you bring it before God. All right, today, however, we are going to talk about the second one, the right to be offended. Ooh. Who's already offended between now and um, the start of the service? My right to be offended, and I want to give credit to who credit is due. I use the book and the teaching of um, Pastor Greg Crichel from Life Church. But often, some of the most smallest and most, most insignificant things rile us up. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but for me, one of the things that riles me up is people who drive slow. <sighs> and, and, and often, you know, when you go to, it's, it's not when I go from home to Itarot or home to Invercargill, that's fine. It's when you are go on a road trip and then there is a vehicle in front of you, perhaps a camper van. <laughs> and I'm driving and I'm literally saying, <laughs> Go to the side, let me pass. And sometimes those, those, those things, right, those signs that say, like, let people pass. And then I read it out loud in a loud voice so that hopefully they can hear it. Abe always giggles. Abe doesn't giggle. Chuckle. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Abe chuckles. And he always says to me, you're very passionate about driving. I know you have a lot to say about driving. And I do. Or I go, like, if it's so annoying, turn right, turn right. <laughs> and I just get so annoyed. And, and it's like, move over. And when it takes too long, it's like, it's not respectful. You're not respecting all the 20 cars. Look in the mirror. Can you not see the 20 cars that are behind you? Just look. 
Um, can you relate? Yes. <laughs> a- Abe has his thing. I know he was just laughing at me, so I'm just getting back to him. But Abe has his thing. Um, so we're in the office together, and the things that rile Abe up is if he has to correct something, like so he rings up maybe LIC or whatever, a company, and they haven't done something or they've ordered the wrong thing, and Abe just says, oh, can you do that? And then they'll say, I'll do that for you. And I... I giggle, so I'm just sitting there because I go, you're not doing that for me. (laughs) Uh, And it's always, you're not doing that for me. You're not doing that for me. Or when people say, um, ring him up, and this is not when people he knows, but people who doesn't know, hey, mate, I'm I'm not your mate. (laughs) It's the little things that rile us up. So everybody can relate. Good. You know, and it could be things like, um, you know, sometimes you don't like the tone of somebody's voice, um, or sometimes people are slow to respond. You've just sent them a text, and they haven't replied in five minutes, or they haven't replied in 15 minutes. Like, what's wrong with them? Is their time more important than my time? Um, or, or, or <laughs> you know, sometimes you do something nice or whatever, or you've, you've organized something, and you're not getting an acknowledgement. You know, just a little oh, that was lovely, or a, a thank you card, or a thank you note, um, or, or somebody did something and they really should have apologized, but they're not apologizing. Like, why are they not saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm sorry? Or maybe there could be a number of things. Like, I don't like the way he's acting. I don't like the way she's dressing. Um, um, in, in church, Ooh, we can easily be offended. Um, we should sing more hymns. We should sing less hymns. <laughs> um, oh, those kids were out of control again. Are you reading what version of the Bible? <laughs> Why is it that we are so easily offended? The reason is this. If you're writing notes, you should write this down. Because we are living out of our egos, our very insecure egos, And we want to be two things. We want to be either or right or we want to win. We want to be right or we want to win. In order to be right, somebody else has to be wrong. And either to win, somebody else has to lose. In fact, what happens often when we take offense, we can form close friendship and relationships with people who have we, we think a common base, a common um, thing that we share, but often we share a common enemy. <laughs> like a group that we don't like them. We're not like that. And in our society, unfortunately, it's a very sad condition that we're becoming very polarized in opinions. And everybody has an opinion. Everybody has something to say. Um, looking, if you want examples of offense, just go on social media, (laughs) you know, all the comments, and then somebody is offended by a comment of somebody, and then somebody will be offended by the comment of somebody that gave on a comment to a comment. (laughs) But this is what the Bible says. A man's wisdom gives him patience, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. We live in a world that is so quick to judge, quick to call a foul, quick to be offended, very slow to overlook an offense. Now, overlooking of an offense does not mean that you pretend it did not happen. Overlooking an offense is a form of forgiveness. And actually, when you you know, look in the Hebrew word, and when you're just looking at the word overlook, it is actually exactly that. It is like an elevating over a problem. So I want you to think when you are in a plane and the plane takes up, what do you see? Everything down you get smaller. The people get smaller. And it's kind of like that. You, you, you rise up over the issue and you just put yourself on a higher place and you just overlook it. You pass over. 
You see, we're really living out of our egos instead of living out of the grace that God extends to us through Jesus Christ. We're going to camp today a little bit around this scripture. And it says this in Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Who knows who wrote this? Paul. What did Paul do before he became a Christian? <laughs> he killed Christians or he was involved in the killing of Christians. He persecuted them. But God extended to him a tremendous amount of grace. Did other Christians extend Paul any grace? The answer is yes. Has God extended you any grace in your life? The answer is yes. So what are we to do then? We are to extend that same grace to other people. Yes. So looking at this scripture, I want to bring three points that I hope is helpful. The first point, because of Christ's grace. The first point, because of Christ's grace to me, I'll give others the benefit of the doubt. Ephesians 4, 2 says this, always, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. See, it's because of God's grace and his love towards me that I give others the benefit of the doubt. But do you know what we do? We are such funny creatures. We often judge others by their actions we judge ourselves by our intentions. <laughs> hmm, well, look what they did. <laughs> but when we do something, it's kind of, but you need to look at my heart, my intention. Um, I've used this example so often, but I do think it, it struck me so much. Um, uh, when we were on holiday, um, the kids were small, we were in central, Otago, we're at a shop, it was five to five, and the people started, the management closed the shop. I thought it was a good teaching moment for our children to teach them, you know, show them bad um, um, attitudes, work attitudes, and we say, look, you can just tell the people here do not care about this job, um, they will never be, uh, <laughs> they will never um, be a manager or owner, because it's five to five, all they want is get rid of the people. I was offended, I was riled up, um, and then, so the shop closed, and then we went to a restaurant. Lo and behold, in comes running, the same woman who worked in the shop. She put on her, her thing, and she went on and served us. And so I was like, oh. And we talked to her, she was from South Africa, and they just landed here, and she had three jobs to keep her family going. And I was quick, quick to judge, quick to be offended. Abe's mother, um, my mother-in-law, she wrote a book, the intention of the book was to provide us children and grandchildren with stories. She said, one day I'm not here and you have stories that you have questions. And so she made a memoir of her life. But of course, it is her version of history, right? That's, there's nothing wrong with that, her version of history. But there were some things that just gave offense to her sister-in-law. And when you read it, yes, perhaps, <laughs> and, and of course, so this all boiled over and, 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 you know, broken relationship, but credit to them both, she went to her and said, that was not my intention, I am so sorry, and she overlooked the offense, and they mended their relationship, because she looked at the intent and not at the action. I'm just giving those examples to stir, you know, examples of your 
own life. Because of the grace given to me, I'll just simply give others the benefit of the doubt. So if somebody's short with you, you know, maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe their teenager at home is just giving them headaches at the moment, you know. Maybe there is some, an, a note from the doctor, you don't know. Maybe somebody, something has happened to somebody. Um, maybe they're just running a bit behind and that's why they're um, cutting you out in traffic or, or, you know, just be quick. Um, to, well, not even go there. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, as a follower of Christ, what we want is to have a thick skin and a soft heart. Often, we are the other way around. A hard heart and a soft skin. When you go and get counseling training, the first thing you learn is hurting people hurt people. And so when you're dealing with people who are hurting and are defensive or wounded, just think they often have been hurt themselves. And they're hurting and hurt people hurt people. Uh, and what then happens, you start looking things from compassion, which is a way better way to go. If you think in the animal world, an animal who defends itself can be aggressive. And what was interesting, um, the, the other day, last week, we were just had, having a meeting and we were talking um, with one of the teams about stock sense. And I can talk to you guys here about stock sense and you, you sort of can learn it, but you have it. Um, have any one of you ever had people on your farm that are just too, too noisy <laughs> with stock? And they're rah, 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 like this, and you know, and stock flies everywhere. And all you needed to do was, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> and then sometimes these people come in and they go, hurry up! And then every, you know, all the the cows that you've you've put back, or the sheep, or whatever, um, are all over the show. I think we need to have people sense, just like we need stock sense. Think about that, you farmers. Have compassion. Because of the grace given to me through Christ, I will give others the benefit of the doubt. The second thing that I want to take from this scripture is this. Because of the grace given to me in Christ, I will not label others. I will not label other people. Can you imagine what would happen if God labeled us? I was six years old and I stole a five-cent plastic whistle at the Vibra. What if God had labeled me Anita the thief? I'd still be Anita the thief. Sorry, Wibra. But we seem to do that, hey? And what, not only do we label, we, we often label something permanent over something that was temporal, that was temperate, you know? Something happened at some stage, and we're still labeling. Oh, he's nothing but a, you, you fill in the blanks. He's nothing but a, he's a no-hoper. He's, he's lazy. She's, she's an idiot. She's always drunk. He's such a control freak. Oh, what a fatty. Oh, way too posh. What an overachiever. What a gossiper. What an annoyer. We label people permanently over a temporary moment in time. This is what Jesus said. He said, be merciful. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Because of the grace Christ gave to me, I will not label others. You know, labeling is even more dangerous than we perhaps think, especially like, you know, you might have labeled your spouse. He's this, she's that. And what we're doing, we're discounting what God could do in their lives. We do it with our children at times. We've seen a certain behavior, now we've labeled them, totally discounting what the change around transformation power of God can do in their lives. 
the other day, I caught myself, well, Abe actually caught myself, caught me um, with a label that I've put over my life. And you, some of you know the label because I still use it, that I am not a good cook. And, and the, I know it's a lie, but I'm still, and the thing is what I was telling Abe, I said, because, I'm serious, I said, because when I grew up, mum had same meal every Monday we had the same, every Tuesday we had the same, every Wednesday we had the same. Our macaroni was macaroni, all right? You're thinking, oh, macaroni, no, macaroni. <laughs> all right, no sauce, no meatballs, macaroni. And I beat, no, macaroni. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not getting it, macaroni. And Friday was kidney beans. And what I mean is kidney beans. <laughs> All right. So, and I was sharing that with Abe, and Abe said, and how long have you been away from your home? And I was like, 35 years. <laughs> and he said, have you never cooked in those 35 years? And I was still holding on to things a label I put on myself 35 years ago. And anyone who's been at my house, um, you, I've not fed you macaroni. If it was macaroni, it was scrumptious. But it still has made me uncomfortable about things like hosp hospitality because I've labeled myself. And um, I can say this about myself, but what about the things that we have labeled people on? And we've labeled them because something happened 35 years ago, and we're still labeling them for that thing. We, you know, we, remember how we just said we're so happy that we're, we're not where we used to be, but we're, we're celebrating where we are. Then let's not label ourselves or anybody else. And the third one, is I will forgive as I have been forgiven. I will forgive others as Christ has forgiven me. Colossians 3.13 says this, make allowances for each other's faults. Now don't, don't miss this. It says here, and forgive anyone who offends you. Forgive anyone who offends you, Colossians 3.13. That's a pretty firm statement, isn't it? The Lord forgave you, and so you must forgive others. It's as simple as that. So, you know, big, small, if somebody <laughs> drives too slow, get over it. If somebody didn't respond quick enough, get over it. However... You might say, yeah, you could easily say that. It's simple and easy to say, forgive somebody who's done all these little things or perceived little things that annoyed you. But what if somebody has done a massive offense to you or somebody you know? What if somebody has abused you or somebody has abused somebody you love? What if somebody lied and it cost you everything? What if somebody has been cheating on you? Like what, all those big things, do, do we just simply overlook? Do we just sort of go in the plane, done? Do, do we just, am I not a little bit justified being angry? Am I not justified in just carry some sort of anger and bitterness? God would understand, wouldn't he? He would understand the revenge for those big things. I don't really have to forgive those things. But what Jesus said, and it's already up there in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, is very sobering. And he says simply this, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins... What does it say? Your father will not forgive your sins. That's very sobering. That's, 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 that's really, really sobering. And on this last point, I just want to, if that's okay, I want to read 
a little bit out of Greg Cruchel's, um Alter Ego book. And he's saying this. When I found out, this is Greg Cruchel, that my little sister's sixth grade teacher molested her, there was nothing in me wanting to forgive nothing. How do you forgive that? How do you forgive abuse? And not just when somebody abuses you, because sometimes you can get over that easier than you can when someone abuses someone you love. How do you forgive betrayal? How do you forgive someone in an authority position that abuses their authority and hurts innocent people? How, how, how do you forgive something that seems totally unforgivable? Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. And what did he do? God forgave. How do we forgive? We are to forgive just as we have been forgiven. That is how we are to forgive. We are to forgive just as we have been forgiven. And that is, by the grace of God, he enabled our family to do to the man that stole my sister's innocence. It was a process. It was a long, long, long process. It was years. What's really cool is that the closer I get to God, says Greg Grishel, the more forgiveness becomes not a process and the more it's not a process. And he gives an example, Amy, his wife, and I had some friends that we somehow hurt, we're not sure how, but they turned on us and they started telling lies about us, which we're somewhat used to, just you know, in this kind of a role, that kind of stuff happened. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it happens. But the lies they told were very significant ones. They were what you would call ministry-ending lies. In other words, if these things were true, I would be disqualified from being a pastor. So that's significant, says Greg. In the past, I would have been furious. I would have been defending myself. I would have been confronting them. I would have been trying to get all my ducks in a row. But this time, for some reason, we had compassion on our friends. We thought, I wonder what in the world is going on in their lives for them to act in that way. He said it was supernatural compassion, and we just started praying for them. We didn't defend ourselves. We just said, we know the truth. God is our defender so we do not have to defend ourselves, and we prayed over them. And what happened is, instead of forgiveness being a process of time, we were actually able to forgive them in real time. I love that, real time. And as, as the offense was occurring, we were forgiving. And it was for God's glory that we were able to catch some spiritual altitude, and in real time, Pass over the offense. It is, as in the scripture said, for God's glory to pass over an offense. And we forgive as we have been forgiven. And what's so great about it is that when you think about how God forgives, if you take an altar, you go back to the Old Testament times, how would the people forgive? They would take an innocent animal and they would sacrifice the animal at the altar, right? And with the shedding of blood, they would be forgiven. There's a story about the Passover when they would actually take the blood of a lamb, dip it at a sponge on top of their doorpost, and then on the sides of the doorposts. Well, what would happen to the blood of the top of the doorpost? It would actually drop down to the bottom. And there you see hidden in the Old Testament a foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus, where the lamb's blood would be shed and the death angel would pass over. What do you see now in the New Testament because of Jesus? Because of the Lamb of God, Jesus and his shed blood that covers our sin, God now passes over and forgives our sins in real time. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ did. I said before, hurting people hurt people. 
forgiven people forgive people. Because it's not about us, it's all about him. I don't have a right to be offended. I'm not justified in my anger. It's not about me winning, but it's because of what Christ did for me. Now I can be, have the honor to give people the benefit of the doubt. I'm honored to not label others. And because of what Christ did for me, I'm honored to forgive others as I have been forgiven. Doesn't mean it's easy. And as we are walking this out, it might take time, but I believe as we're walking it out, it will come in real time. In real time, to his glory, to pass over an offense. Amen? Let's pray. And could we just have um, the worship team come up? Oh, Father, we pray today that through your spirit, you will bring healing in our lives, where there are offenses, that we would forgive God. Father, I pray over those areas that we are holding grudges, Father, that we would let go. Father, we learn today that because of Christ's grace to me, that we are to give others the benefit of the doubt, that we are not to label others, that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. So right now, just for, you know, just for a moment, as I've been speaking, and, and right now in this atmosphere of surrendering this to the altar, back to God and placed on the altar, what is it that God has been speaking to you today? Has he revealed some of these offenses? What is he revealing to you today? And in your heart, are you now at a place that you would say, I want to put that on the altar? I want to put that on the altar. I surrender it all to you. Take my offenses, Father God, my need to be offended. I believe that is some of our prayer today. For some of you, I really feel to say this, and we prayed this in the prayer room this morning. Some of you have held on to a grudge long enough. It's time to let go. Because the person that is imprisoned in unforgiveness is not the abuser. It is you. And I believe that you're not here by accident. God wants to set you free this morning. So what is it in this teaching today that God has revealed to you through his Holy Spirit that he says time, 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 time. Just lay it on the altar. Just lay it on the altar. The word says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Now forgive this person. Realize that the prisoner was you and be set free. Father, we acknowledge hurt people hurt people, but forgiven people forgive people. We're just going to pass over now these things. And Father, create in us a thick skin and a soft heart. Be with us as we journey walking in love, as we be transformed and we'll come to a place that we will respond in the same way to people and situations that Jesus did. Reduce us to love. Amen. This was the Otauto Connect message of the week. For more, go to the Otautau Connect website for other inspiring messages.